It's, it, it's just crazy that you, you went from a farm that was trying to automate robots to pick tomatoes off the vine to, uh, to like a, you know, relatively, you know, Boston Microgreens is a pretty large size microgreens farm, but in terms of farming in general, it's like a much smaller kind of system than oh. like, I'm sure you've seen some of these large scale greenhouses. I've been in greenhouses where you literally can't see the other end, just cucumbers. Yeah. It's, or it, the it, ceiling. It's the scale. I mean, it just, you know, 90 yeah. stories of hydroponic lettuce. I mean, yeah. It is. Welcome to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Martin Schmidheine from Boston Microgreens. Martin is the head of cultivation at Boston Microgreens and is very passionate about the work he's doing there. We're going to talk about getting into the industry without a farming background, the problems that are solved on a daily basis at Boston Microgreens, working and leading a microgreens farm team, and so much more. This is a really great episode, and I'm excited for you guys to hear Martin's story and enthusiasm for growing food. Let's get right into it. Hey, Martin. It's uh, really great to have you on the podcast. Same. I'm super excited to have you here. So um, yeah, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. My pleasure, honestly. Awesome. Yeah, I think this is going to be really cool because this is the first time I'm having someone on um, that uh, works for a microgreens farm. And is, uh, you know, uh, uh, so it's a, a different perspective. I think that'll be really great um, to help people that are potentially interested in getting into vertical farming or microgreens um, and get your perspective on it, which I think is uh, I'm really excited for. Um, so to start, I'd love to hear how you kind of got first interested in growing food and how you got involved with Boston Microgreens. Absolutely. Um, so I, uh, I guess I have a fairly unorthodox, um, path to, uh, to microgreens and farming in general, um, that may be a common experience with people in general. Um, so I actually spent 20 years, uh, in archeology span and material science before I, um, sort of lost a, uh, position to COVID. I think that was probably a big transition for many people. Um, and I had this opportunity to really just rethink the trajectory of my career and how I could uh, bring previous uh, sort of skills and job experience to bear on something new if I was going to make a change. You know, that was definitely the time to do it. Um, so what I what I did is I focused my efforts in just getting some good training. I went to uh, the um, the Urban Farming Institute here in Boston in Mattapan, which is a very unique institution. It's um, kind of the only uh, the only real uh, structured educational resource for that kind of farming in the city. Uh, certainly the first one and probably still the most um, uh, the most prolific, I'd say. Um, and uh, yeah, so I went through their training. A part of that uh, training was also kind of thinking about developing a business model, sort of how to think about farming as a business and really kind of getting your hooks into that as well as just the, you know, the physical labor, all of which I was much more attuned to putting shovels in the ground, moving soil around. That's what I was doing for 20 years in the field. Um, so that was that physical transition was a, an easier one than really thinking about how to make this all work as a business and the balance between profitability and sort of community engagement. These are really difficult things to strike if you don't um, have a grounding in the uh, in the field. And so that that's what I really yeah. wanted to do. Get, get some sense of what that was realistically going to look like. Uh, from there, I was able to get a couple jobs doing different kinds of farming and, and ended up uh, working for um, a company called uh, App Harvest, which has now sadly gone bankrupt. Um, but they had an R&D sort of outpost here in uh, near Boston, and I uh, was able to work for them growing hydroponic tomatoes. So tending oh, a 30-foot cool. hydroponic tomato crop specifically for training agricultural robots. Um, so, right, like kind of growing the tomatoes to, to their spec so that the robots could train and work on these different builds um, that they were trying to, to, to market. Um, so that was definitely unique. And, and so that was really the experience that got me into the wider field of vertical farming and the solutions that are being developed now in different countries and being sort of disseminated across the world on a scale previously not really seen or thought about. Um, so on the strength of that, of that job, I was able to get in with Boston Microgreens. I've been there since. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the nutshell. Um, again, came, came from a different field before and found that there was a lot to apply. 
Awesome. That, that's really cool. Yeah. I, I didn't know much coming into the podcast. I know we met when, we, when, when I was at Boston Microgreens doing the tour. Uh, that's really cool. Um, so when, when did you start working at Boston Microgreens? I recently passed the two-year mark in November, I think it was. So sort of like mid-November uh, 2021, we were slowly waking up out of the you know, stupor and really kind of starting to come around. And so uh, if I remember correctly, the farm had been in somewhat of a stasis over COVID. And so it was it was Oliver's um, sort of restarting the farm up um, with new some new personnel uh, because, yeah, we uh, the farm was ready to operate again. Restaurants were ready to go again. We were getting orders. So uh, he needed a, a team to actually make that run. And uh, so the, I was able to get on board with that, with most of our current team as well. We kind of came on at the same time. Okay, cool. So were were you, were you hired as um, as like a like a, a manager kind of role at Boston Microgreens, or, no, or did it start somewhat differently? No, I was no, I was primarily part of just the 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 physical skill sets needed to maintain and work the farm. Um, there were uh, a number of other people in a, a, a similar sort of shorter term, just physical capacity. Let's get things up and moving. Let's, you know, be able to produce greens and, you know, fill some orders. Um, and and uh, I, I was really just a question of finding who was a good fit and who sort of had long-term potential and um, was really willing to kind of commit to the business. Again, not that yeah. there's a problem with deciding that you're not. I just, so that's how it went for me. Um, within a couple months, I think we agreed that um, a, a cultivation role was right for me, and I was willing to step into that sort of slightly larger oversight role. I I hesitate to call myself a manager. Um, I uh, am much more comfortable thinking of it as just sort of a team effort, uh, because realistically, there's no way to grow food with uh, personally like a hierarchical structure. I think is not super helpful in that sort of context, but. Um, but yeah, so that's how I came on board. Um, it's 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 been a busy two years, Jonah. So a lot of yeah. lot of twists and turns, and as we know, like making any kind of change on at, you know at scale is really like riding a battleship. So re whether you've got a field farm or you're growing edible flowers or microgreens or whatever it is that you're doing and producing, um, you know, implementing changes takes a long time. Whether it's changing grow days with one variety or completely you know, making a new process for a workflow, that's, it, it can take a long time to write those ships. So um, definitely needed some persistence for that. For sure. Yeah. One, one thing that uh, I thought was, was really unique was when I visited was the energy of you and the team and the dynamic of like, mm. you know, we're just going to, we're just going to get it done. We're going to get the work done and everyone knows what they need to do. There's no like, okay, do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? It was just very efficient like well organized with it among yourselves. So like you said, I think, I think it's a good way you put it that I think it, it seemed like the team is, is, uh, um, very self-directed and then maybe you just help guide them on things. Like if there's an issue that pops up or there's a change that's going to happen Would that, would that be an accurate way to kind of describe, um, part, part of your role with, with the team? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I, so we'll, 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 I'm sure we'll come back to this, but part of what makes Boston Microgreens unique, I think, is just the sheer diversity of things that we grow. Uh, so we, at any given time, have at least uh, 30 varieties, you know, up to 45. So it, it really kind of, I, I think it's a lot about having someone to be able to have the bird's eye view on how everything is functioning and having a real maybe slightly deeper sense of what varieties will grow well together under the same conditions, how we can move things around to maximize the capacity that we have. You know, often we're in a crunch sort of situation where not everything will fit on the rack. Like we have to find ways for um, things to grow effectively as we can. Um, that is a little bit outside of the, um, the rote. Well, you know, this is what we have to do every day, like the daily steps. There's definitely a dimension of, of oversight just needing to, um, uh, deal with that complexity. Um, and that is, so I'd say that is a big part of what I, what I do. Yes. For sure. Okay, cool. When you're growing that many varieties, the complexity is starts getting a lot more difficult to manage. Um, like at living earth, we were growing, I don't know, 10 or 12 varieties and we, we used to grow a lot more and then we kind of cut back to keep it simple, focus on, um, the crops that had the highest demand, but because 
but I believe you guys are, are probably still selling mostly, if not all to, to the chefs. Um, mm -hmm. they, they want like diversity and they're changing their menu. So you have to kind of work directly with them in that capacity, which can be a challenge in and of itself, but obviously a lot of relationship building and, uh, and, and fulfillment in, in that aspect of the business. Do you do any of the, uh, any of that relationship management or, or like who kind of does that at Boston Mike Greens now? Uh, so no, so that is, uh, that is largely Bennett's work. So he is, um, uh, both delivery and sales. Uh, so he takes that that part of the operations. Listen, like Jonah, I, I like to think of myself as a people person, um, but I, I I think that kind of uh, engagement with with the with the clients directly and really getting the feedback. Hey, you know, how can we make this right? Do you want it bigger, smaller? What do you think of the taste? How's the yield? Um, are you getting your value for your money? Like that kind of uh, I, I think that requires a lot of um, it requires a lot of just good people skills in the way where that I prefer to apply that energy to plants. You know, that's, yeah. that's kind of where my conversation, my dialogue is. I'm, I'm, I'm talking more to them and, um, I, I think that's okay. I, I think it's good to have a certain yeah. separation. Um, it's good to cross train. It's, it's good to be aware of what, uh, you know, everyone else is doing. Um, but at some point it is also important just to realize what your, what your strengths are not. Um, and, and yeah where to really best apply your time and resources. So, so no, that's uh, Bennett and Tony. We, again, we can talk about them and what they do if you like, um, worthy of their own podcast episodes, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, I, uh, but yeah, I, I am, I am very sort of farm facing farm and product yeah. facing. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that, that's great to know. Yeah. That that's kind of the role that I, w that I, I started with, like, that's what I wanted was just to grow plants and focus on production and things like that. And then it kind of, obviously as the business grows, the business owner has to kind of diverge that. So it's nice that you can kind of stick to that as Boston Microgreens grows that you can kind of stay and focus on the cultivation side of things. Um, Cause one, obviously I can tell that's what you're passionate about. Um, and two, there's probably, you know, like you said, other team members that would love to do that, that side of the business um, and may not want to do as much of the cultivation as an example. So um, that's great that you have like a clear separation on uh, who does uh, that kind of stuff in the business. But in terms of customers, mm -hmm. wh what would you say, like, are most of the customers chefs or are you, are you still doing like direct to consumer or anything like that online store? Um, so no, we, the bulk of our business is definitely chefs, uh, and, and restaurants in the city. Um, we have sort of expanded into Cambridge a little bit, but like by and large, uh, the heart of Boston is our main, uh, main market. Um, we do some direct to consumer sales. Uh, I'd, I'd say, and again, we can put a pin in this as well and circle back, but, um, so the residential market is, uh, been a tougher nut to crack in terms of the product that we sell and the way that we grow it. Um, yeah. we have had. So before we came on board, when the farm was just starting up, I think market had, uh, Mar Oliver probably had some experiences with markets that were not ideal for the growing conditions that we had. Um, so we do, we do like to have a market presence when we can, um, but it is f far less of a financial, uh, instrument for us and much more of just a kind of community facing, uh, thing to, you know, show, show some colors and show off our product and let people know that we're there. Um, so we do do some sure. direct sales. You can place orders on our website, uh, but by and large, um, it is restaurants that we yeah. specialize our production for, which understandably is not necessarily the same product that a residential customer would want. We are working on it though. Definitely some stuff in the works um, and just new new year, new approach, new, new, new ideas. Um, so yeah, we're constantly working on expanding our base. Awesome. And uh, in terms of the um, chef restaurant market, what would you say are the the most consistently best selling varieties or mixes um, that you provide? So, because of the sheer diversity that we have, um, there are there are a lot of people that you know really love certain things. But on a on a bigger scale, I'd say so. It's our so what I what I call our our, our trifecta is uh, so the the shiso, our red shiso. Um, our cilantro and our Genovese basil and the Thai basil, I guess I could fold into that, are de probably the biggest um, sellers. Like that, those are three main pillars of the of the business. Um, we sell a, a mustard wasabi, which is also just gorgeous, and we sell that to a lot of uh, sushi places. Um, the green shiso as well, uh, very popular with seafood and sushi places. Uh, I, I could definitely go on, but those are like the, those big three, and. Um, 
Yeah, the wasabi, the uh, she so maybe the, the fennel as well is also consistent favorite. Um, anything in a fi fine herbs mix, yeah. Yeah, the uh, when I was there, the shiso was just mm. perfect. Mm. Her, all, all of her was uh, um, was very proud of uh, of the work you guys are doing with um, uh, with with perfect night recipe. Are, are you finding it's like I was there in October, so now it's mm -hmm. been I don't know four months or so. Are you still finding yeah. quite good consistency with with uh, with the shiso in terms of? Oh yeah, no, oh yes, oh yeah, yeah. we okay. yeah, yeah. I, I cracked that code. <laughs> Um, nice. definitely, definitely made that work. Yeah. It was, um, it was, it was tough going for a while there again. It just, um, sometimes the, the elements are just against you and whatever kind of farming you do, this is something we have to plan for. And again, like writing, writing those failures can be a really monumental task. Um, but yeah, no, the, the Shiso really came through for us and had some good discussions with seed suppliers themselves. And again, just really, there's a lot of dimensions to solving that problem. And one of them is, yeah. um, understanding what you're fixing. So, so yeah, yeah the Shiso sure. was a great success for us. Yeah, I think that that's that's a good point you bring up. With um, uh, I think a, a lot of myself included for a long time would um, kind of just try a bunch of things. Um, but one thing that I found was was really helpful. We we had this uh, very unusual um, brassica mold that is very. Uh, un, like almost unknown in in the world, and it just came on some seed that we got. Mm. Um, and for a while, we were we were just thinking, oh, it's like it's a mold, so we got to do this and do that, you know, sort of thing. And then we sent it to the University of Guelph and got the analysis and found out what it actually is. And then we were much able to figure out how to manage it, um, e even though there was a limited amount of information. So it's always great to like if you're having a issue with with a crop, like kind of take a like a like a step back and look at all the different variables and see like, okay, if this is a major issue, maybe it's worth it to see, okay, is it potentially a disease in the soil that's just not showing symptoms as an example? And then, you know, for a hundred bucks or whatever it is, you can send in, get the results and figure out, okay, no, it's not that maybe it's the seed and then, you know, do some germination tests and paper towel or whatever, you know, in, yeah. in a controlled right. environment. To, so, so I, I think that, that, that approach is um, like the more scientific approach is really helpful for di di diagnosing and like perfecting uh, growing recipes. Cause you like the, the science, from my experience, the science really seems to work well. If you take that approach to fixing these problems rather than just like throwing random things that maybe will work. And sometimes you got to do that cause there may not be a clear path to take. Um, but I think that, that that approach seems to work quite well for me. And it sounds like you guys might have taken a similar approach in, in solving some of these these kind of yeah. crop related yeah. issues. Yeah, experimentation is absolutely a really valuable thing. Um, as you just said, like knowing what it is that you are examining uh, will just save a lot of grief in the long run. Um, and I, th I, just, I, I think it's I think this is an important point, too, because vertical farming involves um, it, on some scale, when people talk about it, when we compare results in industries and the way people are doing things. I, I think data is a very easy thing to generate. And I think data is a very easy thing to chase. Um, I, I think it's really possible to get lost in the weeds, as it were, uh, to get sort of lost in your data or like just have a lot of data that you're not really sure how to parse and interpret. Data interpretation is a different thing than data generation, right? The numbers yeah. will not necessarily tell you what you're looking for. And unless you can control for variables and really have an idea of what is relevant and what is not and you know, why you're looking at these decimals when you're really just caring about the rounding up, right? Like you can always generate more data. The question is, how is it going to help you succeed? And um, yeah. so the experimentation I do with the farm is very much geared towards solving specific problems um, and, you know, not generating data that's not going to get me anywhere. Um, I'm, I'm ultimately interested in my final metric, which is yield per tray, right? So yeah. Um, that's kind of what it's going to come down to. Yeah, that's a that's a great point because if you think about uh, like let's say you're keeping track of just yield and none of the changes, then you'd be like, okay, you you could there's a whole bunch of assumptions you can make. You'd be like, oh, the summer we always get higher yields than the winter, but maybe it's not necessarily temperature if you're not keeping track of that. Maybe it's humidity or something else. So mm -hmm. it's like you really have to control the variables to oh, yeah. to have the data be be valuable because if it's if if like there's five things changing at once you can just like say, oh, this is the correlation, but it's maybe not actually the case. So um, yeah, having, you're, it's a good point, having uh, uh, a lot of data without being able to accurately interpret it 
or analyze it doesn't really do much for you. Uh, so yeah, like if you just, as an example, just had yields, it's not going to really tell you much if you don't have what's causing the yields to change uh, and be able to actually figure out like one variable at a time, what is making these things uh, go up or down in terms of yield, as, if if that's the the metric to focus on, you know? Absolutely. Um, yep. Yeah. In complete agreement. So that's, yeah. again, it's a big part of what I need to control for my job. For sure. Um, so I'd love to hear uh, what an average week looks like um, as the head of cultivation at Boston Microgreens. Well, I guess as much as I'd say as, as much as possible, we really try to sit down together, Tony and Bennett and myself uh, with our team members, Karina and Hugo. So we, we try to sit down as much as possible every Monday and just take 10 minutes, if not half an hour to go over what we're going to, you know, what the two week forecast is like. Um, if there have been big cancellations or restaurant closures, or um, if we're going to have to deal with product that's already in the rack, but has been canceled. So all, all of these kinds of um, just accounting for the work we're going to have to do for the week saves us trouble in the long run. Um, so the, the value of the even brief team meeting, I think, does a lot for us. Uh, we find that when we can't get together for some reason, like, you know, there's just a lot to catch up on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then um, things fall through the cracks. So I'd say getting the team together for just a, a, a quick sit down is always a good thing. Try to start a Monday that way. Um, then uh, as far as the week goes, we have a fairly regular schedule. I'd imagine most microgreen farms do because we're all about the scheduling um, and getting things out at the right time for the right people on the right day at the right. So, um, uh, so, so on one hand, we do have a very regular schedule. Certain things come out on Tuesday. We're always, always going to harvest Tuesday, Thursday, uh, Tuesday, Friday. We're going to cycle things out on these days. Um, so that is good. No, being able to gauge your sort of work flow, um, and always allowing time for something to not go right because it's going to be something, uh, yeah. <laughs> or there's some tool we can't find or there's some problem we can't solve immediately. So, um, just knowing where that time is available to confront those challenges. Again, always just good to have that overview. Um, yeah, sorry, does that answer the question? Um, yeah, so so like in terms, so so you said Tuesdays and Thursdays are harvest and then- Sorry, uh, Tuesdays and Fridays. Tuesdays and Fridays are harvest and delivery and you, days, yeah. And delivery days, so you do the <laughs> harvest and delivery in the same day. Same day, wow. same span of ideally seven hours, like tops. Yeah, and then, do you plant seven days a week or five days a week? How does kind of the planting schedule work? In general, we plant five days a week. Um, this is to just leave the weekends. So we have one of the team members who comes in on weekends and tends the farm. Um, in the interest of lightening that workload, we we tend to only seed five days so that um, so that he's not stuck sort of doing extra seeding as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, like we will occasionally make exceptions for holidays and such, but, um, in general, yeah, we will, we will seed five days a week and we've adapted our growing schedules to that. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I feel we, we have a very similar mindset, um, in that, uh, one, one of, one of the staff at living earth mentioned to have kind of these, um, these like morning meetings before on harvest days, just to update all the staff. And it made such a big difference in, like just having everyone on the same page and everyone understanding what the, what the goals are for the day, what the goals are for the week, the month. Um, and it literally takes like 10, 15 minutes to just update the team. Um, and I think it's, it's just really powerful uh, to, to do that. And it's something that, you know, as a, uh, like a individual starting a microgreens business, they may be like, like you, you get to a point where you start hiring people and you don't have the skill set like kind of I didn't have, or I didn't really mm -hmm. think about those kind of things, but it really makes a big difference in having everyone on the same page and working together as a team rather than like me telling uh, someone something and then the message kind of getting mismatched in, in the, in the crossover to more staff and stuff like that. So it's just really great to, uh, to have those, like, you know, we did it on harvest days, but even just once a week is plenty to, to get everyone up to speed and get everyone on the same page. So that's great that, uh, that you're doing that. And, and also trying to minimize the amount of time that, uh, staff are in on the weekend. We tried to do the same thing as much as we could. Um, but we found that, um, as we scaled bigger and bigger, certain things just became too much during the week. And some people actually preferred to work weekends, you know, so yeah. we were able to kind of like move things around based on what staff wanted because they're 
in a migraine schedule, there is as much as there's a fixed schedule, like you can really, uh, if you, if you like, for example, we, we would seed and mix soil like a week in advance. So you mm -hmm. can kind of, we used to do it all in one day and give it to one staff and that staff member, just like that role kept getting turnover because like, it's a, like a lot of soil mixing, a lot of seeding. <laughs> it's, it, it was, I didn't, I didn't realize that it was, that was a problem. And then we started splitting it up and then the role became a much more enjoyable role to, uh, to, to, to work in. So it was just something yeah. that I thought was really, really interesting, um, to, to apply, to kind of move the schedule around for what works for the staff. And that'll change as you have different staff at the farm, um, which, which is kind of cool. So it's nice to be able to give that flexibility as an example, like. I'm guessing that the staff don't have to come in at 8 a.m. on Saturday. They can come in whenever sort of thing, um, which is what we adapted. And I'm guessing it's probably the same there because it seems like you have the mm -hmm. same mindset. As long as the work gets done, that's all that really matters. Yeah. And again, just um, in terms of like work-life balance, I guess it plays directly into that, right? Just making sure everyone is in a place to be able to hit all these marks and, you know, not forget stuff. You kind of need to be in a okay physical and mental place to do that so it's it's again it's something that we really um not just encouraging each other but i, I don't want to say unwritten rule but it is very important to us um that everyone takes the space that they need in the way that they need it um some people prefer to just work a lot and do paid vacations some people do four-day weeks like like i do um and uh work from home a bit so it yeah, whatever those needs are, I think it's really important to make space for that and um, to have the kind of business structure where that can be accommodated. It's kind of priceless. You know, it's really, really hard to put a monetary uh, sort of number on on that, um, especially yeah. these days and especially since, you know, the pandemic and this whole kind of rethinking of what it is that we value in our work and how we are valued for our work. For sure. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think uh, COVID changed uh, uh, a lot of things and uh, so, some some maybe not for the better, but a lot of things, including that for the better, you know, it, it's it's really nice to be able to, you know, run a business or work for a business that you have that kind of flexibility. Now, there's a certain extent to the flexibility that a microgreens farm can give you because, for example, like I had to work almost every Christmas for the last like oh, you know, 10 years, as an example. Right. This is my this is my first year. I didn't. Um, I remember Oliver kind of like, you know, being in the same boat where he was saying, you know, he was yeah, because like certain things got to be done. If it's on a, if it's on a harvest day, you can't really necessarily always move that around or it's a lot of work to move it around just yeah. for that one day sort of thing. Um, so it, it's, it's nice to be able to provide as much flexibility as you can within the context of knowing that microgreens are really a 365 day a year business with ways to minimize that and make it more flexible. Uh, as much as you can to try to do that, which I think is is great because it makes it much less uh, the odds of staff or owners burning out, which I think is one of the biggest challenges with microgreens is is just like burnout from from too much repetitive, uh, you know, week after week, day after day kind of uh, flow. Absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Awesome. Uh, so being head of cultivation, I'm guessing you've dealt with your fair share of uh, pest and disease mm. uh, challenges with, with microgreens. Uh, it's, it's, it's a ne like it's, it, my experience has been, an, it's a never ending battle. It's just kind of managing it. I'd love to hear kind of what your experience has been the last two years in, uh, in managing pest and disease and some, maybe uh -huh. some, some successes, some challenges and, oh, and yeah. Um, well, I'd say, I guess if I think about that kind of, I, I'd, I'd say there's sort of, I, I separate two big buckets. I mean, you've sort of got the physical controls, um, you've got your mouse traps and your sort of your bug lights and, you know, that, that, the, the things you can install to sort of deter and tra trap things as it were. Again, we're in a converted basement in South Boston. Okay. Like stuff's going to get in. Um, we, we have a fairly well-sealed farm, but you know, this we're, it's all built on swamp, right? Like, so, so there's, there's definitely stuff around. We do, so there's that physical, um, component, uh, yeah. I shy away from things like poisons personally, um, just because I am completely, uh, we need to control for all the sort of pest mitigation things that we have. 
Uh, and poison is not one that can do that. Um, certainly not on a farm. And I, I, I'm just against that spreading around or in contaminating in any way our product. So I don't yeah. um, deal with that. Um, I guess I'm also dealing with airflow I'm thinking of and sort of water tables in the bays uh, and um, pH of the water and the growing medium. So like the interaction between the substrate and the water. Um, again, we use us. Uh, we haven't mentioned that yet, but we, we grow in a soil substrate. Um, it's currently a sterile peat moss, peat moss substrate um, with um, with uh, ebb and flow tables. So that's how we grow. Um, so so that interaction is wildly important for inhibiting you know different kinds of molds and um, that the air the airborne mold vector. Um, so that's kind of what I attribute more to sort of the the, the chemical and um, soft side of pest mitigation. Um, yeah. So I guess the, uh, those are the two big buckets. Is there a, is there a, is there a material solution I can use for this? Can I change the pH? Can I add a nutrient? Can I make it more resilient? Um, and you know, can I stop these effing mice from coming in and, you know, the dead of winter, like it's all, all placed at the same thing, but, um, yeah. So again, luckily, it's not worse than that. So we have, we have gnats. We have the occasional rodents in the building. Um, we, we share the building space. It's not ours. Um, yeah. But yeah, as much much as I can personally have a hand in it, it's more of the sort of pH and the, um, again, the the substrates, keeping that all yeah um, healthy. So so you you um, you you pH the water that you that you you flood is that is that for disease management or for the nutrients as well so it's both for inhibiting molds and for optimizing nutrient uptake so i there, there's only again we um we we don't we don't have a lot of very sensitive systems for these kinds of readings um i've got my ph pens i've got my uh, my litmus papers and things. So there, there's a range that I can reasonably aim for. Um, yeah. So personally, I aim for between six and six and a half in my tanks um, to to mitigate um, just the opportunistic molds and flash molds and you know, anything that might come in the soil that we're not um, that we don't have secondary sterilization for. Um, and then again, the nutrient uptake, I just find that to be an important component of all this because the ones that I'm particularly trying to get into the plants, which is calcium, um, will absorb a little bit better as you nudge it kind of towards seven. But I, I don't personally like to keep it at seven if I can. That's about our pH from the tap. And um, or uh, once I peel in the tank and put our nutrients, I've got about seven. Um, and that's just a little high for me. So I, I am between six and six and a half. Um, that's the 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 sweet spot of sort of nutrient uptake and molten inhibition but yeah do you it's, do you find um that there is like disease spreading in the in because you have like a flood and drain recirculating kind of system mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. the, the water that's recirculated do, do you have to disinfect that that water or add something to it to keep it kind of clean as more and more bacteria start growing in, in the water of fungus? So in general, so I have, I have used zero to all the treat water before. Um, I, not, not amazing results. Personally speaking, I, I, I enjoy, I like the product, but I, I haven't really used it on a large scale, um, reservoir application. Um, generally speaking, our tanks turn over fast enough where that is not my primary concern. Okay. So, um, we have 35 gallon tanks, for example, for each like 40, maybe 40 tray uh, large bays. Um, and those tend to be used up to 80%, I'd say within a week. Oh, wow. Especially if we have more water intensive crop crops, like it just kind of depends. But in general, the turnover is such that I'm more concerned about the tray itself um, instead of the water, again, just because it turns mm -hmm. over fast enough. Yeah, um, yeah. So in that time, I regulate the nutrients, I regulate the pH as I can, um, and it's it, again, it's not a zero, um, it, it's it's not a zero concern thing. But really, I find where the best applications for that kind of mitigation are in the tray itself. So I have much better experience, like using the zero tall directly on um, trays out of germ to inhibit sort of opportunistic molds that'll then just settle in and 
really, really figuring out where the airflow is best distributed and getting bigger circulators and just sort of making sure things are equalized between the racks. Just keeping things moving is very important. Um, yeah. Even if there are molds in the air, like if they don't settle, they're not going to get on your plants, right? So like I'd say it's it's more the dynamism, really. I'd say that, that kind of keeps it healthy. It's like just keep it, keep things moving around. Keep them turned over. Don't let things just sort of sit there. That is probably the worst thing that, you know, I've seen the, the worst effects that I've seen on seeds and and uh, and plants. When you yeah. when you say just sit there, you mean like if it needs to go out of germination? Oh, and sorry, it sits no, there I, for I, no, I I mean if it's in a if it's in a um if it's in a place in the bay, you don't want it sitting in water. Like, oh, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, you, you don't want a situation where your tray is neither sort of um, well circulated nor well drained. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Um, yeah. And it's just, yeah. you know, with a thousand plus trays, it, it, it can be difficult to make sure like every single tray um, is treated that. So again, there, there's a large scale thing and then a smaller scale. Let's hone in on the specific. Why is this tray misbehaving when the other seven in the bay are not right? Stuff like that. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, more more like spot spot treatments. And and again, as you probably know, like a lot of the varieties we have aren't alive long enough necessarily, or, you know, we don't grow them long enough for uh, certain kinds of molds and um, uh, to, to really be of concern. So if something, yeah. you know, our radishes grow for seven days um, and even our longest growers, some are more resilient, some are not. So really, again, that whole like diversity yeah. thing. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. There's like a, a downy mildew on basil that just ravages mm. basil out outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, and it's gotten much worse, uh, you know, the last, you know, 15, 20 years. Uh, I just spread like, like crazy outdoors. But it's never affected micro basil uh, that I've grown because probably because it just it can't take over in that, you know, 16, 17 day period. Like right. it needs more time to, to develop. Um, so it's kind of nice that there's a very generally speaking, there's a small amount of potential diseases that can affect microgreens. But obviously, the longer you grow them, the more risk there is of, of that. Now, in terms of uh, trays, um, are you guys are disinfecting them after after each grow? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we have. Uh, okay. um, I mean, it's kind of all of our jobs to keep the farm clean and basic sanitation and uh, industrial hygiene. I mean, that's that's baked in. Um, but yeah, our so our, our our tray regime is is pretty strict, and uh, this goes as well for growing trays as well as covers. Like anything we'd use as a as a cover tray um, for yeah. blackout or for. Um, um, you know, the clear domes, whether they have holes or not. So all of those same, same sterilization, um, you know, hot water, soap, zero tall sterilizer, degreasers, all, all, you know, these different things that we use to keep them clean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the flood, the flood, the flood tables themselves, they get the same kind of same treatment. treatment. So again, okay, we try to cool. turn those again, it's just, it's a lot. Right. And so for one or two people to be doing that, um, we kind of need to break it out again, part of the scheduling every week. What tanks are we going to clean? Uh, what racks are we going to clean? This was scheduled for this week, but you know what? This is a real mess. Let's move this around, do this one first. Um, so again, and I find half, keeping an eye on all that basic stuff and having someone whose job it is and who is recognized for that super important contribution to the process. Right. Yeah. The, um, so I, I don't care what it is that anyone's doing at the farm. It's all, extremely valuable. There's no such thing as a mundane task. Um, and it's all part of the process. And so I, I think recognizing that is important. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's a lot of repetitive tasks. I, I often call repetitive tasks mundane, but you know, it, it's, it's really just a perspective thing, I think, because there's some people that I've had, we've had so many volunteers, uh, at living earth over the years that were like, yeah, packing, packing migraines is like meditative to them. And, and it's just great to like hear this, these kind of different perspectives is it really helps to expand your, your perspective when you hear other people kind of having a different perspective on something like that. So I think, I think that was, that, as an example, that was, I think that was uh, really cool just to have that, that different perspective on yeah. some of these tasks that I would call like, you know, what I would call mundane or repetitive, um, that some people just find so much joy and, and, uh, and accomplishment in doing those tasks, which you know, there is a lot because, because of, you know, the fact that you're growing food doesn't really matter necessarily what 
part it is you're contributing to the whole system of growing this like really nutritious, healthy food and feeding people in your community. So um, I think just feeling into that, I think, is is really powerful for staff or for volunteers that are part of the process, no matter what they're doing, even right. if it's like cleaning trays. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, it's just it's very easy to say that until you've cleaned 200 trays to spec. Right. <laughs> I mean, like. I think it's easy to forget. It's not like doing dishes or something, right? Like you're, yeah. Um, you, you need to be thorough in a way that you don't necessarily think of. Um, and and again, this is all just. Um, I guess Jonah, like, I, I'm I'm really glad I joined Boston Microgreens because uh, for some time before that, I was really thinking of going into business for myself. You know, these uh, we haven't touched on it, but like container farms, a lot of people sort of were playing with those kind of turnkey solutions and. Um, um, do in part doing microgreens in them too. And so I, I was thinking of something like that. I, I was just kind of sick of answering to um, the corporate world. It was never really the best fit. The money was great, but um, I, uh, I I really sought that independence, and I, I thought this was a good way to get it. Very quickly realized that I knew nothing of business. I've been in the service industry for you know my entire career, effectively. Um, and it's good to get these different perspectives before one decides to, um, you know, really go go the go the whole hog. Um, I may come back to that in the future. I don't know, um, but there's a lot of just this kind of basic um, um, understanding of the of the business infrastructure and like all of the different um, things involved. I am really glad for that perspective now. Yeah, yeah, no, that I think that's really great because um, also one thing for just like advice I would give to people that are maybe interested in starting a, a migrants farm, but don't know for sure if they want to do it is like go work for one, like get f find a migrants farm in your local area. There's thousands of them now across across the U.S. and Canada and, and starting to pop up all over the place. So even, even just volunteer at one. And that gives yeah. you a sense of like what it's really like um, before you start actually doing it because there's um you know running a business is very different than like you know growing microgreens in 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 your room for personal consumption it's it's they are two different things and um uh i, th I think there's a ton of value in in, in doing either um mm -hmm. but they are mm -hmm. very different and and sometimes like like i think sometimes for for me there, there's a there's a part of me that just loves the growing side and would love to just like cultivate microgreens and, you know, and, and I can, I can, I considered me not my greens cause it wasn't really much of a thing back, uh, when I started it, but, um, just to work at like a greenhouse and, and, um, and just be in the sun and, and, uh, and cultivate plants, be around plants, which is, uh, uh, I think something we share is just like a love for, for being around plants and the energy you get and, and seeing them grow and that sort of thing. Um, and then for, for me personally, like I started volunteering at a farm and saw that that was like too intense for me from like a manual labor perspective that mm -hmm. you know I, I was young too and it was just at too much physical labor and migraines is really nice because it's a good balance it's physical but it's not like you're gonna get super injured um in your job working for a migraines farm which is which is really really a huge benefit compared to outdoor farming um that people don't maybe consider is how physically demanding outdoor farming is compared to migraines i remember i had a uh, uh, a staff at Living Earth in the early years that we had, um, we hired someone that was saying like the, it was like very laborious to grow microgreens for that staff. Uh, and then I asked someone that used to work on an outdoor farm and I was like, what's the physical uh, exertion level needed for outdoor farming versus migraines farming? And he was like, maybe 10% of, uh, of the level of exertion you need to put out or energy you need to expel to grow, uh, to do the process of microgreens versus outdoor farming. So just to give some perspective to people on, on that, that are interested in, in outdoor farming, if you have the energy and you love being outside, it's, it's great, but there is definitely challenges with, uh, uh, the physical side of it, getting injured again, the repetitive nature, but repetitive nature, like bent down backs, bent over in an unnatural position, that sort of thing. Um, but kind of getting off topic here. <laughs> No, no, I hear you. I mean, listen, this again, it ties into the first uh, introduction that I made of myself. I mean, I part of the reason that this made sense for me is because I had 20 years of like learning to do that um, effectively. And because 
being in the service industry, your physical presence in your body is the tool with which you are conducting your task and doing your work. And it's a really, it's very easy to lose sight of how valuable an asset that is. And you can't put a shovel in the ground for years on end without figuring out, well, listen, if I do it this way, less back pain, and I'm not going to have this forever, right? So in my personal case, that made sense. It was no no object to me to make that transition. Um, but that's just it. In microgreens, as in farming generally, but like there is re very little that is irrelevant and very little that can't be applied well. Um, and I love the fact that people come from different sort of walks of life, as they say, and you know, different perspectives and, and backgrounds, because it's going to need a lot of different solutions. Like yeah. this whole food air deal, like we're going to need a lot of different solutions to contribute to this and a lot of different people to make those solutions work. Um, 100%. Yeah, right. Like as long as, as easy as it is to think about vertical farming as a monolith, um, it is a very diverse term, like has a lot of different things under that umbrella. And I, I, I really enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's just crazy that you, you went from farm that was trying to automate robots to pick tomatoes off the vine to, uh, to like a, you know, relatively, you know, Boston microgreens is a pretty large size microgreens farm, but in terms of farming in general, it's like a much smaller kind of system than oh. like, I'm sure you've seen some of these large scale greenhouses. I've been in greenhouses where you literally can't see the other end just cucumbers. Yeah. It's, or it, the it, ceiling. It's the scales. It just, you know, 90 yeah. stories of hydroponic lettuce. I mean, yeah, it is uh, quite, quite, quite amazing. But again, it's just, it's just a different scope, right? And just the, the capacity that a farm like that has, you can't do what we do on a farm like that. Um, yeah. Because it's a, diff it's a different uh, objective, exactly. different clientele. They're going straight to distributors, right? Like all that aeroponic stuff, amazing, amazing yields, amazing tech, amazing automation, AI, you know, all of that stuff. Fantastic. But, you know, we, you can't lay hands on every single tray and, you know, grow 40 different varieties that way. That is part of what we pride ourselves on. Um, yeah. We'd love to expand, but I don't think it's going to be a question of our physical location expanding and much more a question of synergizing with other um, farms that we support and sort of set up and work with. Right. So, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I, I think that it, there, there's its own unique challenges in that, but I think that's, that's a, um, like it's a, from what Oliver's um, uh, talked to me about in, in I, I can't remember if it was in the interview or not, but he, that they're working with other farms to kind of get product into Boston sort of thing. Um, so that like, there's more collaboration rather yeah. than just expanding your farm out yes. physically, uh, is to work with other farms and, you know, maybe have, have some sort of agreement where you, maybe you sell the product from, they grow it for you or vice versa, depending yes. on what your skill set is as, as your farm. Cause some farms are, you know, can be really great at marketing and others can be really great at production. And then, you know, there's some that are great at both sort of thing, but you can kind of utilize your expertise or area of, of, uh, that your, your business is excelling in and collaborate with others that are, uh, doing maybe the opposite, um, uh, part of, of, of that, that business equation that they're excelling in that you guys can kind of cross collaborate, which I think is, is something I'm excited to see more and more of yeah, in the microphone space. Same, same. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, given how many varieties of microgreens you guys mm -hmm. grow, what your personal favorite is oh. and, uh, and how do you use that at home? Yeah, no, I've been waiting for this is actually super, this is super fun. I actually have some props. I'm ready here on the side. Um, so I was, I was mentioning the red shiso before, uh, which is really my, it's hard to play favorites, but it, it really is one of my favorites, uh, just cause I, I spent so much time and care on this plant to like get it up to snuff, uh, and really have it be a product we can be proud of. So like the red shiso is something I will just love forever. So one thing I do with the shiso when I, when I can get some, so I, I make this nice, uh, sugar syrup. So I take um, the herbs that we'll get from the farm. So I'll take my shiso and maybe my, my anise hyssop or sort of whatever's left over really. And I just boil them down with some some sugar and make like a nice simple syrup. Um, that's quite herby, beautiful cocktail base. Um, so that's a, that's a big hit. Cool. I love that. Um, so that's, that's any aromatic herbs and especially the shiso I'll do that with. Um, my kid is also very fond of making pickles. So, um, I'll throw them into our pickle jars. Mm. Um, I've got some nasturtium in this, uh, pickle jar, which I'm also very fond of. Uh, just a nice peppery bite. And I think this had some leftover shiso as well. All the anthocyanins are gone out. It's kind of leached out of the, 
plant, but um, yeah, so we'll use those in pickling. Uh, and I'm also very fond of some of the really unique stuff we do, like uh, like borage. Um, so borage is something we came back to in the last year. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Um, yeah. And uh, then we will do the um, the tahoon as well, which we're coming back to. Are you familiar with tahoon? It's it's uh, basically oh. a species of mahogany, um, and so you're you're essentially growing tiny little trees. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the okay. foliage of this particular seed has a really like just a really dense like uh, umami sort of flavor. It's like a nutty aroma yeah, with kind yeah. of a, almost a bacony uh, undertone. I'm really fond of it. It, it tends to divide people. Um, I think I think uh, on one of the last episodes of the podcast, um, Cooper Crest, I had Cooper Crest on, and they were telling me about that. And that was the first mm -hmm. time I ever heard of it. And then I just oh. clicked as you were mentioning it. That I, I think it's the, the same thing, which is really cool because I, I didn't know. I thought it, they were the only one growing it. But that's awesome that you guys are growing growing that as well. That's really cool. Yeah, again, it's just kind of a little. It's a little niche plant. And it can be a really tricky one um, to grow, but uh, um, but that's definitely like a really unique thing we do. Um, what else? Oh, and we started growing sage is another recent success. Um, I'm really fond of the sage just because it's a nice, uh, it's just a nice illustration of how the first 10 days of a plant's life, like generate all this amazing chemistry, phytochemistry, and just, just the biological anatomical wonder to me is like really um, illustrated by the sage. Within 10 days, you have all of the characteristics literally that I would expect of a sage leaf, um, you know, in this tiny half inch, uh, half inch shoot and sprout. Like it's just truly amazing. Just loaded with terpenes and that really kind of dank, like sagey flavor. It's a very heavy yeah. crop for its size. So again, I, I just, I like how, um, how plants will continue to surprise me and, um, and, uh, and, and inspire me really. Popcorn's another one that we do that I really like tends to divide people also, but again, just that, that kind of savory, sugary hit in the big stock, like tends to surprise people. They've rarely sort of seen maize do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. We associate it with our corn cobs, you know, not the sort of the early yellow sh shoots and leaves. So uh, again, when restaurants want it, it's a big, it's a big seller, but tends to be more of a spring summer thing. Yeah. Those are some of yeah. the kind of more, um, uh, popular and unique things that we that we have, but again, I, I could go on forever. I you know, probably have awesome. some stuff. Yeah. Even just the way you're using the herbs, I think is like so like just from a personal use is so unique. Like I've never seen anyone make a syrup. It's it's honestly like genius way to use them, you know, because oh. then it, they're they're preserved and and you can like you said use them for cocktails, or I'm sure they're they're probably good in adding into like. I don't even know, like teas maybe would be really a good way. Yeah, like I've never tried adding, like, that, honey. but uh, yeah. I chop them all into yogurt. Like if in doubt, you know, I just chop whatever herbs I have into yogurt and <laughs> add that to my meal. And that's, you know, just a real nice lift. And uh, it's always a conversation starter, you know, dinner party people love yeah, that stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's uh that's awesome. Yeah, I feel like I should definitely put you in touch with uh, with Sango Seed. It's, it's Coper Cress's uh, seed company. They sell like all sorts of unique varieties of seed to other farms. Um, oh, far and okay. they're, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of varieties that like they grow that just, I, I don't know if anyone else really grows. So um, it, it would be cool to, to, to get you guys in touch. Cause maybe there's, there's some unique varieties you can, you can, um, uh, you know, send out to, to the chefs that want something new and, and fun and, and interesting. It's, it'll be more work for you for sure, because yeah. uh, that, that's, you know, but, but that's what you love to do. So that's um, what we're here for. Yeah. 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 So, so it seemed like they had some really unique, uh, unique varieties. So yeah, I'll definitely put you guys in touch. Um, now going on to uh, uh, the last few sections of the podcast here, if you could just there magic exists and you could just wave a wand and instantly solve uh, a challenge that you face in your job. What, what specific issue Ooh. would you want to resolve? Oh man. Uh, it's a, with great power, something, something. Um, I, I, I probably say the, the one thing that comes to mind right off the top is just the way that we deal with our substrate and our soil. Um, obviously sort of, it's a, you know, it's a one, one use per soil trade. We can't really reuse the soil. Um, and because we are in this converted basement in Saudi, um, you know, we need to literally physically move all of that soil in. 
and physically move it all out. That is a lot of work. Um, we'll get a soil delivery probably once every month or so, five weeks, it depends on the, on the load. Um, but so that's, you know, 30 to 40 bales of 60 pound soil blocks all going down the cellar in a basement. So if I could, if I could streamline that, I would love to do it. Um, I guess now that I'm talking it through though, I, I guess to, to my mind, it's less about um, fixing the process and more about closing the loop. I guess that's how I think about it. Um, so we have a small community garden across the way um, that we used to do some, uh, just had some collaboration with. Um, and uh, we were able to compost our soil there. So we'd, we'd take it up, still physically demanding. We were able to kind of pile it up and do, do a nice compost. And then people could um, either use it or we had blueberry farmers come and take it away. So it was just a little bit more of a closed loop to me and, and less of a, um, okay, well, so, so again, I'm thankful that we have a landscaping partner uh, that we work with where we can drop, drop the soil off. It's good for them. It's good for us. Um, but I would much prefer to have that be like a tighter loop, uh, either get it to the zoo or have it composted effectively. We can't obviously do it in the farm. Uh, there are various issues with that, among others, space. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to have sort of a, a dedicated space that's meant for that to 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 compost and grow and get people involved in forking stuff over. And that's all um, very great. And I would I would prefer that I would. That would be the first situation I remedy just just based on the physical labor component. Um, and uh, you know, don't I, I don't like storing however many uh, harvested trays, you know, for a day until we can get it out in the van and take it to the place. So, yeah, I'd say like the use and disposal and composting of the substrate loop is the, yeah. the, the first thing that comes to mind. Um, yeah. 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 No. I, I, after vi seeing your facility, like visiting uh, uh, the farm, I can understand why. Because the the way the building, like there was an elevator, I believe, but still, yeah, like right. to lug all the the it's, you know stuff uh, up and down, and it, it, yeah, it's, it's a mixed it's use building. And, yeah. Just yeah. Um, and and again, I I I acknowledge that it is a there are always challenges to work around, and and we. Um, we appreciate our neighbors and we, we want to be good neighbors in the building. Um, but yeah, that's just, it's, it's a, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big challenge. And, um, I would love to just have a way to maybe even plug the community and, you know, to like make, make, make the composting of that a more closed loop and a more, uh, logical extension of our presence in, in just in, yeah. in, in the neighborhood, you know, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough pro problem to to solve. Like like even just from like a resource perspective, like there's a time perspective, but there's also the resource perspective where you're like harvesting this PMOS from uh, from bogs, and then um, you know like like ideally you'd want to be able to reuse that soil at some point in the operation. But it's like being in a city, it's practically like that's practically impossible because you need somewhere to store it, um, have it compost, and then have it re delivered. It, it, it's, it's quite a, a challenge in and of itself. Um, and then from, from I, I've seen uh, where you can have, like, depending on the building, which I, and your building, I don't think you could do it because you don't have like big windows, but if there's big windows, you could have like a, almost like a, like a crane kind of system oh. where you just like, yep. you know, have an automated crank, you know, to, to bring up the, and drop down the soil. Um, there, there was someone I, I did consulting for that did that in their, in their house because they had a big window. So they were able to just like, throw the empty soil into a bin they had on the, on, yeah, the, on I, the, awesome. the ground, you know? Yeah. But, yes. but in, in, uh, in, in your case, that's, that's not possible because there's no, there's, there's, there's no way to do that there. Sadly, not yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we might think about a new space, but I, I, as of right now, uh, that, that we just, we work with what we've got. Yeah, um, exactly. And, uh, I just, yeah, but I would like to crack the zoo. I mean, I, I've, I've contacted them a couple times. It would really, you know, and I'm I, maybe for microgreen growers, generally speaking, I mean, I, I'm genuinely interested if that is like a, 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 a vector for, for our substrates. I don't know. Like if there's any yeah. uh, zoo professionals out there, please, please contact Jonah and um, disseminate this information. Cause I am genuinely curious, like whether animals, you know, can get anything from grazing off of microgreen substrate trays. It seems like it's loaded with kind of just, really nice kind of trace, uh, trace nutrients yeah. and fibers and stuff. I mean, 
yeah. Anyway, um, just I, th- thought. I, th- I think I, I know like chickens and, and things like like more farm animals will eat like the the roots of like a pe- uh, like you know the leftover seeds and stuff on a pea shoot tray as an example. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. and there's and there's always seeds in there that, that they'll find their way, but. Uh, every animal is different. So, you know, it, it, like I feel like a farm would be a good place to, to put it because it's like good free, you know, soil for, for amendment. And then if they have animals, it's it's a good, uh, not a big food source, but there, there are, you know, there actually are like farms. They're not like microgreens farms, but they're like fodder farms. So they'll just grow like wheatgrass or barley or something. Right. Yeah. Like hydroponically. <laughs> And mm-hmm. the, they can like a, a lot of these farms can feed in the winter months when there's really no grass growing in the north. You know, they can they can give them really good nutrition. So um, there could be some, um, you know, animal farms. Uh, you know, I know Boston's a big city like Toronto, so I don't think there's going to be any close by. But that's another potential use case uh, as like like fodder material, uh, especially if you cut the stems higher on the trays. There, there's there's material there that could be consumed now. Whether For it's sure, yeah. valuable enough, you know, but just just an idea on, on that. Yeah, no, thanks, yeah. John. Again, I listen. No, no idea in this regard is uh, invalid or uh, not useful. Yeah, I, again, like however we can close these loops. I, I think microgreens industries and like every business has this on their mind somewhere, and the industry as a whole and vertical farming as a bigger whole um, is all about closing those loops. Right? It's, it's all about making things ultimately more sustainable and more. Um, or in any in any case, contributing to the solutions that we're going to require to to normalize a food system which is just broken. Um, yeah, and that that um, so I, I I think we share that as kind of a, a main drive and a main vision. For but sure. yeah, it, as yeah. regards to work processes, I'd say the soil is kind of that. Definitely, again, as we've seen a lot of a lot of components to that. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, what would you say is the the most time sensitive or resource intensive task in your daily operations? And if you could like streamline it or automate one aspect of your of, of the the business of itself, the cultivation side, what do you think that would make sense to to do? Um, I mean, I guess I. Just in terms of physical labor, again, like the whole, uh, you know, the trays and the domes and all of that industrial hygiene, I, th- I think, uh, again, it's really important to get that done. It's really important to recognize people who do it. Um, but it is ultimately a lot of labor. I, I-, I think if I could get some team members um, working on other things instead of just washing trays and being compensated the same amount, I think it could do a lot for the business. But, you know, I, I-, I think short of an industrial sort of chemistry lab grade dishwasher you know we're not really gonna have anything that suits our needs and um yeah i i honestly yeah, the, sorry it's like the soil is just such a big issue for us that i i keep coming back to that but uh i, I guess maybe seed weighing um so we still have we don't really have that automated to any great degree and i would love to save us the work of you know, measuring out all our seeded trays and cups, um, for example, and just kind of keeping those, you know, lined up. And it's it's a fairly efficient system that we have to label trays and get the right amount of seed in the right cup for the right, right tray and have these seeding operations. So we, we, we do it well. Um, but if we could avoid, you know, filling two, 300 cups with finite, tiny amounts of seeds and don't want to go too much over and, you know, half a gram of anise, more or less is actually a lot of anise in the tray. And, you know, just yeah. being able to account for that, uh, I, I think would be great. Um, if I could automate that and, you know, train them a little bit more on sort of tending the plants, I would love that. Um, but I, I guess as we spoke about in the beginning, I'm, I'm, I'm invested in everyone sort of being able to both contribute and and cross train at least a, a, a bit to some degree in, in what the others are, are doing. Um, and I, I really rely on my team members to give me feedback about what is happening when I'm not there or things that they notice in a tray that, that I didn't yeah. or right. Because um, so, so I, I just, I guess I value that highly. I, I would love to enhance that and encourage that more and have more time available for that. Um, but yeah, the uh, 
seedings, you know, it's just a big part of our business, yeah. as you know. Uh, yeah. And getting that all right is important, and um, it just yeah can that that can that can take that can take some time. Um, how, how long does it take to to weigh out those those few hundred? Again, it depends on the week, but I'd say easily. Uh, I mean, easily the better part of probably ninety minutes. Um, de- again, d- depends on that. You yeah. can measure out radishes a lot easier than you know anise or lemon balm or something. But yeah, um, yeah, I'd say nine a good ninety minutes, and you know, making sure the labels are printed. And if I have experiments that need special labeling, I just I need to make sure that's all in a place where it's not going to get confused. Things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Again, good communication goes a long way, like in any relationship. Yeah. But, um, yeah, just the, the the physical arrangement of those towers. I don't know if you've ever knocked over a tower of like carefully seated, you know, cups. Um, but that is, oh boy, if we could That's, avoid that, yeah. that would be great. Doesn't happen often. Yeah, you know, everyone sure. gets one. I'm sure everyone's done it once at the farm. But, yeah, um, yeah, just why tempt fate? You know, I I yeah. love so to. We, it, it's 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 kind of it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because uh, I'm not sure if you know what uh, uh, myself and Vertigro are, are working on, but we we have um, the the seating machine that will be coming out this spring. That oh. uh, pretty much the way the way it'll work is you have different cylinders that have different uh, hole sizes for different types of seed. So it won't work with every seed off the bat, but what yeah. our goal is eventually to have even more cylinders for people that, for example, if you're growing Sherville, it's a very unique shaped seed. Yeah, right? yeah, Any yeah. sort of small round seed, even cilantro, it'll work with with all of those. So you have uh-huh. different uh-huh. cylinder sizes for the, the type of seed, and then you have different wheels that will adjust the amount of seed that comes out over a tray. Mm-hmm. So instead mm-hmm. of having to, uh, to, to have to actually uh, weigh out each seed, we're gonna make a chart that'll say for each variety, well, maybe not every variety of microgreen because there's so many, but each variety of microgreen, what, what cylinder to use, what wheel to use, and approximately how much seed it's going to give you when you roll it over a tray. And that'll wow. save on two ends, which is weighing out the seed and then actually dispersing the seed evenly, which is, yeah. from what I see, you guys are doing a great job at that. But having the fact that you can kind of do two in one and then have it be completely even over the whole tray, and it's going to do soak peas as well, which is really cool because that, that's one thing that... Uh, uh, a lot of people do soak peas still, so um, we mm-hmm, want mm-hmm. to make it like really versatile. So that's going to be out hopefully. It's both, like next month, oh, wow. um, okay. and that, I mean, that'll that's... be a huge game changer for a lot of people because, like you said, ninety minutes you take you take that off the table completely, and then you save time on the actual seating for any farm that's doing like you know hundred trays or more. It'll pay for itself pretty fast. Yeah, um, huh. and it's, huh. it's it's small, so it, which is also good for for a farm like like uh, Boston Migrants because it, it like you know. Our, for example, the seating machine we have at Living Earth, one, it's very expensive. Uh, you can't even get it anymore because they're not um, they're not selling it because they're so busy with other equipment. And it takes like, you know, I think it's like eight feet long by, you know, a foot and a half or two feet wide. So most farms mm-hmm. don't necessarily have the space for that. So this is like right. a handheld tool that you just roll on a table. So uh-huh. uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that that is being one of the more, uh, uh, you know, um, resource intensive tasks that you're doing that you would like to, to, to automate because um, we will have that available pretty soon, which is, which is really cool. I'm, I'm super excited for, uh, to get this out to, to farms. Cause like everyone we've showed it to has been like, when can I get this? Like I've had yeah, farms yeah. that reach out like, can you, can you send this to me now? And we're like, we're going as fast as we can. We want to make sure we're, we're sending out something good. That's going to work properly. Um, so there's obviously a, a bit more testing involved in that, but um, yeah, I think it'll be a really, big game changer for, for, uh, uh, seeding trays, getting even seeding, but also the time component of yeah. it. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'll definitely let you know when, when yes, that's, please uh, do. Please when, do. When all, that's I'm, yeah. I'm all ears. Um, and then as we're getting closer to, to, to wrap up, um, mm-hmm. I know Oliver's had some, uh, educational initiatives. Um, w- has anyone else in the farm been a part of those? And I don't know if you can expand on, on what's been done with, with that? Um, so yeah, when, as the farm was starting back up in late, uh, 21, um, I remember being part of the initial discussions about that. Um, so what, what initial, what, what the initial idea was for, uh, Boston Microgreens to take a bigger, um, educational role, um, in the community and outreach and, you know, just kind of getting, getting, um, getting our work and our, um, perspective and just microgreens and farming and 
just awareness of this kind of uh, yeah, food growing and systems um, into the community. Um, we quickly decided to make it just a separate effort entirely because it was very difficult to allocate people working on the farm to kind of take their hours and put them towards B. It, uh, it was important to draw some boundaries. Um, yeah. And so I think the decision was made ultimately to just uh, make it a 501c3 and, and just have it be a separate entity entirely. And this has worked well for us um, because so I, I, so I am not directly involved in that. Um, I was, um, part of the initial conversations around the dimensions and, you know, how we should think about all this, but, um, I, I, I kind of made it clear that I can't do both and, um, that if, if I was going to, you know, do my job even semi-effectively, right, I kind of needed to be focused, uh, on, on, on the farm. And that made sense because there are people who are very good at outreach and communication and, uh, and, and, and fundraising and kind of you know, connecting with neighborhood elements. And we needed those people to be um, ha at the helm um, rather than people who are kind of doing it part time and mostly through Instagram or whatever, you know, so just kind of figuring yeah, out you yeah. know, what, how, how people are realistically going to contribute to this. Um, uh, yeah. So it's, so it's a great, um, it's a great project. I, I really appreciate what we are doing. Um, so we say, we basically, sorry, I say we, so BYFP puts, um, puts, uh, these educational programs together and walks a class, uh, through, um, I think about a month of microgreen growing and does a couple of oh, varieties wow, cool. and, you know, kind of get a couple lessons out of it on basic plant anatomy and, and growth and germination. Uh, they'll generally tour the farm and kind of see us in action. And that's all, that's always really fun, um, to kind of yeah. interact with students, but it's good that it's not my primary job because, um, again, I just want to be focused on what I can do with the farm. Um, For but sure. that is definitely an initiative that grew out of Boston microgreens directly and tries to connect with other educational elements in the area that do similar things. Uh, you know, this is Boston. Like there are a lot of interested community facing food and agricultural projects that is, Awesome. I'm just not yeah. physically part of them, but I, I could plug a bunch of them. I mean, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got Green City Growers. Sorry, it's like I have to. We've got Green City Growers in Somerville. They do amazing work. We've got um, the Food Project. We've got Project Bread. Um, we've got, again, UFI. We've got um, We Grow Microgreens, uh, who I wouldn't say is a competitor of ours. We do fundamentally different things, but they're over in Hyde Park and have an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, greenhouse and grounds and um, uh, they, they have fantastic educational programs and they do great internships as well. And, um, they do a lot of things that we can't, um, yeah. they, have, they have a nursery, right? So they're doing more like trees and, um, fruits alongside their microgreens, all of which are great. And so they have fantastic products. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so there is a lot of drive here. I will say that for Boston, Massachusetts, it's a big agricultural state and people deserve to know more about the real dimensions of, I think it's just easy to forget like living in the big city. I mean, it's easy yeah. to forget how much agriculture is actually happening in the Northeast in Massachusetts and how long it's been here and really how um, really from the native populations down, like we have taken advantage of, you know, the geological propensity for good agriculture here. Um, and the fact that Boston is a diverse and vibrant city and has all kinds of people in it and really is in a unique position to kind of help um, raise awareness of this, of how broken the food system is and how easy it is to take steps to remedy that. Um, For sure. So yeah. yeah, that's where we're at. Yeah. I think, I think, I think it's smart to have it. I think that was a good decision. Uh, Cause I, I, there's so many aspects, like, like I really wanted to build community with living earth farm and to a certain aspect we did, but it took my time away from growing the business. So like, it, I, I totally understand that dynamic where it's like, you only have so much time resource in a, in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year. And it's like, how do you want to allocate it and separating it out so that it's not the same entity, I think is probably a really smart way to do it because it's a different business, right? It's, it's, oh, yeah. or, or a different en entity. It's not even a business, it's a different entity with a different set of goals. Like Boston Microgreens is trying to feed people and educate people to a certain degree, but the the education side of of the the nonprofit is like 
that that's the sole goal of it is to help people become aware of the issues in, in with food, how to how to grow food and how to become more self-sufficient, all those kind of things. So I think separating out's really smart. It's actually the same methodology that I used in focusing on education rather mm -hmm. than continuing to run Living Earth because I had to spread yep. my resources thin and I couldn't do it as good of like there's no way I could have done the podcast as an example um, if I was still running Living Earth because yeah. I, I just right. wouldn't have the time or energy. Um, but I really wanted to focus on on education. So it's the same concept where it's like you have to really be um, cognizant of where you're putting your energy and where it makes the most sense. And in that case, to separate it out, I think it was a really smart idea to keep it going, uh, but have it be a separate entity that that have different staff dealing with with the the, the opportunities and challenges um, in that space. Yeah, precisely. I mean, in part, that is possible for us because our owner um, willingly sort of stepped uh, a little bit back, I think, from farm management and, and more specifically is plugging into these specific kinds of engagements and, you know, really being at the helm of BYFP and, and uh, networking farms and all of that and leaving us to um, not not entirely, but, you know, largely self-manage yeah. the farm for its intended uh, goals. Um, and so, again, drawing those boundaries uh, just to reiterate that again is is important, and I think it yeah. it does a lot for businesses to help them succeed. It's very easy to want to cover all these bases because there's a yeah. lot to cover and a lot that's important yeah. and a lot we feel uh, connected to. Um, it's just important to draw the boundary between your personal connection and your professional capacity to you know follow follow that up and really be be behind it. Yeah, yeah, that's a really really I think important point for people to to really settle into and understand is yeah like you know uh, to, to yeah it, it, i think it's just great to have those kind of work personal boundaries because like there's so many things that can cross over very easily and it's and it's not a bad thing necessarily but it's like you're you're putting more energy uh into it when you if you have a limited amount and then you're, you're like your expertise is as an example cultivating microgreens and then like if you had to also um, do the education side and, and and do that on a weekly basis. Like it would spread your energy resource thinner on the cultivation side, um, which, you know, yeah, it's kind of just the, the basis of special specialization. But one question um, I'm uh, really, really excited to, to ask you, which will be the, uh -huh. the, 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 the last one is sure. for, for individuals that are interested in entering either the, you know, vertical farming in, in general or microgreens industry, what advice would you give them based on your experience working for, um, at, was it was App Harvest and then Boston mm -hmm. Microgreens? Um, so would you like specifically getting into the industry or once they're in the industry or both? Maybe, or... maybe both. Yeah, I think both oh, okay. would be great. Um, so as far as fitting into the industry and, it, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about getting involved in any kind of farming, but especially vertical farming and, and, and particularly microgreens, I, I, I think um, I may be biased because I come from this background, but I think anyone who's ever been in any kind of service job and, you know, in any, in any way, shape or form was able to succeed there, uh, I think would do well at any kind of uh, production oriented microgreens farm. I do. Um, because you're just, you're drawing on the same tasks and it's not as much about what you're doing as how you are able to do it and how you are able to work within a team to get that done. Um, I think anyone who has experience, you know, making coffee or, um, you know, selling microwaves or whatever, like whatever segment of the service industry you can draw on, um, those skills are very valued at any farm and especially a microgreens farm, which is really all about um, scheduling, communication, teamwork, and uh, um, being able to bring your, um, your, your capacities to bear on your, on your task. And not, not a lot of, um, not a lot of questions back and forth. Like we just, you know, we, we need, we need to get this done. And um we have the tools that we have and we need to rely on each other as well. Like being able to be in that mindset, I think is a great prerequisite. Um, and again, any kind of teamwork, as I said before, like there's very little, I find that is just irrelevant to this field. Um, pretty much every skill and background has an application. Uh, I wouldn't say that every background necessarily lends itself to like the growing or cultivation side. Um, 
but there are all kinds of skills that this industry needs. And like someone's um, in need of these skills. Not everyone can manage a farm. Not everyone is great at operations. Not everyone is great at growing plants. But you put those people in a room together and they can make amazing things happen with mm. far less equipment or money or time than you thought possible. And it's, so it's really all about, you know, can you contribute in a way where um, y you are doing your best work? Can, can you, can you create a situation with other people where you want to um, make the most of your skills that you might not consider relevant? Can you do that? Great. Then you're absolutely gonna, um, then you absolutely have the potential to succeed. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as I mean, if I think about advice that I would have given myself, um, maybe it was also just coming off the pandemic and sort of being being very used to being in an industry that was just very results focused. Um, uh, so this was, I, I worked in after archeology, span I got into material science and went to co-teach a course at MIT and then ended up in a structural petrography lab. So I was analyzing concrete for structural petrographers. And it was just, you know, it's very much about personal accountability for your observations. And I think I was very hard on myself uh, when I first came into the farming field because it's really hard to not see uh, any, um, any shortcoming or any failure as ultimately, you know, being rooted in an action that you took or an observation you didn't make. Um, and so we have to give ourselves credit, I think is like in a really important thing, like give yourself credit where you can and, um, and, and let it go. Sometimes you just have to let things go. Okay. Like sometimes crops are just going to fail. It's not a question of yeah. you. It's a question of the environment or the seed or, a different batch or lot or whatever it was like, look, you know, it's not always going to go perfectly every time deal with it. Now you can't always fix it in post. Um, you can't always fix it in pre and like, you just need to be aware of that. Um, and be able to sort of see beyond your own failures, uh, or what you perceive as your own failures. Um, and above all, I'd also say I had to learn this the hard way, but like ask for help. Yeah. If you're working in a team that is production oriented and you all have a job to do, you're not always going to be able to f touch every base you want and you're not going to be able to cover every responsibility that you have. And asking, being able to ask for help, being able to articulate a problem and point to how you could receive help um, is vitally important. I think at the beginning we were all very focused on doing our thing and just getting everything right. And we quickly realized that the way to get it right is to, um, you know, be able to patch things where they need patching and fill in where they need filling in and accounting for the unaccountable, because that's ultimately the difference between, you know, the script and the reality. Um, and things look much different in, in a plant science textbook or whatever um, than they ultimately do in a growing rack two days before yeah. harvest when something <laughs> fails that you promised a, sh uh, you know, a, 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 a chef on a new account that you were really excited for. So like that kind of translation is difficult to um, paraphrase and it is vitally important to have that experience and be able to um, work with that. I, I, so again, between recognizing your own worth and um, being able to work as part of a team, um, I think that kind of, that kind of boundary is important. Recognizing yeah. where your limits are and being able to ask for help and uh, again, being able to occasionally let it go. As long as your communication is good, your clients will understand. Um, but if you're not working as part of a team that can be accountable in different ways, just, just, yeah, that's, that's going to loosen yeah. that pillar significantly. That's going to Yeah, weaken. for sure. Yeah, even, even just in like a interview to ask the right questions, I think is, is like for someone that's looking to get into into like a specific company or into the industry like you just want to gain information like a lot of people think like a like a interview is like a, a sales pitch about them which which it is in a way but if if you show like genuine interest and like like passion for trying to understand the challenges that this business has that you can help solve um it, it is is a i think a pretty a pretty good shortcut into and if you really do want to get in this industry is like you know try to to, to help. And then once you get in, like you got to ask a lot of questions because you're not going to know all, most of, the, most of the, the stuff and how the operations work, even with good training manuals and stuff like that, you still, 
it's going to take, you know, a, you asking a lot of questions as the person that's genuinely interested in the business, how it runs, how the production works. Um, and I, I found in my experience, people that ask a lot of questions early on, uh, generally like grasp things better because they're not just making a bunch of assumptions. They're actually like checking, okay, is this the right way to do this? Or is this the, like, you know, is this the way that, it, that this task should be done seating as an example? Um, and yeah, so asking questions early on when you first start a, a, a job, like people think they might be like, like bothering people or stuff like that, but it's, you're, you're making their life easier by doing that upfront work of like getting the right information rather than just making assumptions on how things should be done based on your past experience in previous jobs, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah so I think right. that's, that's uh, helpful. Um, yeah, I agree. I, again, I, I hope I'm giving you some kind of answer because it's, it's been a while since we um, onboarded anybody at Boston Microgreens. Um, I mean, that's our newest hire, Bennett, it's, it's been almost 18 months now. So like, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to sort of reach back and really think about what it was like before. Um, again, because we're like, as a team, we've just gotten to this point where we're very worked in together yeah. and very um, able to even like, you know, predict uh, when things are going to, we, we can account for a lot that we couldn't 18 months ago. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, I mean, even whether, whether you have a vast experience or um, feel like you don't have a lot of experience, uh, the, um, the operations that um, microgreens requires and farming in general, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's going to be very different from one place to another. And regardless of where you are in that web of you know skills and objectives, um, I, I think it's really important to recognize that you are part of a larger whole. Um, yeah, and being able to ask questions and situate yourself in a way that's right for that position. Yeah. Fundamentally important. Yeah. And if you can do that, I don't see that there's any background that you can come from where that would be irrelevant or not, you not be able to succeed. I, again, something yeah. I prize highly about the industry. Yeah. That, that's, it's, it's a good point that like people might think, Oh, I don't have like a background in, in farming and, and, you know, like my experience as well is that like, yes, we would prefer someone that has farming because then we know that they actually enjoy it. Um, I think that that was an important aspect of it, but not from a skill set perspective, because you can, you can like, you know, it's not necessarily the most difficult skill set to learn. It's really about like, if you're passionate about it, you believe in what the company is doing, then I think that's often more important than like having a background in farming or having experience growing food or, or things like that. Cause it, you know, it's a skill set you can definitely learn. It's not something that's like, oh, you have a green thumb or you have a brown thumb sort of thing. I, I, I really don't believe in in that concept at all. I think it's just, if yeah, you're same. passionate about it and you want to learn, then you can. So wrapping up here, if listeners want to connect with you or learn more about mm. Boston Mike Greens, where can they find uh, you guys online and on social media? Uh, it's pretty, pretty easy. Yeah. So we're Boston Microgreens, uh, dot com, um on the internet and, um, and on Insta as well. You can find us at uh, Boston Microgreens. No problem there. Uh, my, my personal work email is martin at microgreens.boston. Uh, if you want to ask me any questions or follow up on anything, get in touch. Absolutely here for that. It's been amazing to have you on. Thanks so much for coming on, Martin. And, oh, uh, same, yeah. Jonah. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of microgreens businesses and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at microgreens consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.